We have a Discord now. Check it out in the description. So, uh, <laughs> this is a bad idea. Have you ever wondered what happened in Tevat before we arrived and just started solving people's problems? Have you ever wondered what the fuck the order of some of these events takes place in? Well, in this crash course, I'm going to be summarizing the entirety of the current timeline as shown on the Genshin Impact Wiki. Now, you might be saying, Whale, this is lower for content. And while I might agree, who else is going to take the burden of reading the entire Wiki article and summarizing it in a more easily digestible and hopefully entertaining fashion? That's right, it's me. So let's not waste any more time and just start talking about Tevat. Once upon a time, there were three moons. Aria, Sonnet, and Canon. Interestingly enough, all three of these names are musical terms. The three sisters did this weird act where they had to switch places three times a month, and if they failed to do so, the Earth would, like, blow up or something, I don't know. On this Earth that the three moon sisters lived above, the race of the Seelies were prosperous. That's right. These blue ghost will-o'-the-wisp looking shits that give us treasure were actually a part of a much larger and much more prosperous civilization. They apparently inhabited the entire planet and not just Tevat proper, which is the Seven Nations. It is said that the areas beyond Tevat proper that the Seelies inhabited has become a wasteland of ghoulish nature, with only the remains of long dead gods in the castle the Seelies once lived in remaining in it. Well, uh, why is this area so shitty anyways? Well, probably because these three idiots, I mean sisters, fucked up one day and forgot to switch places and now everything is dead. Good going, girls. This calamity caused the Seelies to just kind of give up on life and caused them to go from these amazing, beautiful things all the way to these wisps that we see in the game. However, some of these Seelies didn't cave into the crippling sense of disappointment and depression, and so there are apparently some full-formed Seelies left out there to be discovered. Meanwhile, in Moonland up there, the siblings are fighting it out, as siblings do, because nobody can decide whose fault it was to fail to switch places. They bicker about it, then they get into a kitty slop fight, and then two of them just give up, leaving one to forever watch over Tevat. Don't worry, it's not like she's alive or anything. The moon above Tevat is just a corpse of a long dead deity. Good luck getting that out of your head. So if that seemed vague, this next era, the era between the Seelies and the Archon War, gets even vaguer. Time to don those PhD and Genshin lore hats, because it's time to get into the deep shit. After the fall of the Seelies, the planet just kinda looked like shit in general. Everywhere was just ice, flame, and just kind of was a horrible place to live in. In Heart's Desire, the shopkeep mentions that this wine that makes you forget your pain in order to, quote, give them the strength to keep surviving was made during this era. At this point in time, humanity was just barely surviving and life was extremely difficult. But then, according to the TR of Torrin's artifacts, envoys of the gods, I guess they're kind of like angels, descended upon the humans. Do not, not be afraid, afraid, they said. We will, we will make, make your, your living, living conditions, conditions a little less shit. shit. And so they did. They also lived among the humans. These envoys gave these humans food and, more importantly, a reason to exist. Religion. They planted these white... Irminsul trees? Irmin... Uh... Pronunciation. Alright. Irminsul trees. The trees we see in domains. And humans did what humans do best. Worship them. Except this time, the worship actually did something because the trees took a big part in the process that I like to call the hotline. In order to talk to Celestia, just in case you need an extra blessing on your crop this year or something, you would wear a crown made of the branches of this tree and then just descend into the depths of the world to, quote, attain enlightenment. When you return, assuming you returned in the first place, you offer the tiara to the earth and, quoting directly from the wiki here, a mountain of white branched crowns amassed underneath a withered tree, whatever the fuck that means. So then for some reason on the wiki, there's this entire point about how Celestia's nature is cyclical and humanity would thrive and then die and then thrive again and etc. I don't know why it's here of all places, so I don't know. So then there's this group of jackasses that decide, you know, screw the gods, we're cooler than them, we're better than them, let's enter their garden because that always ends well. Surprise, this angers the envoys, and so the chief priest that led the charge gets smitten to the ground, and the rest of humanity gets a solid scolding in the form of an apocalypse. Something that should be noted at some point during this time, the Battle Pass trailer takes place, with the kingdom among the heavens being founded, and the two heirs who were tasked with finding the Genesis Pearl are sent out. Right, so humanity is absolutely trash, but there is hope in the form of Gui Zhang, the god of dust, who decides that humanity isn't an absolute atrocity. She decides to guide humanity through the agricultural period. Today I learned that Gui Zhang is a girl. But in order for her to help these rats, she establishes four commandments. One, to unite in ambition is to be steadfast and immovable, aka work together for a common goal and you might not burn to ashes. Two, wisdom is like water and nourishes all those who receive it, and in it is a reflection of truth. Basically, seek wisdom because it's good and you see the truth in the world because you know that's how wisdom works. Three, fortify the bones that movement be supple when the time comes. I guess this is saying be steadfast and hearty in your values, but when you need to be flexible, that's an easy adjustment. Or maybe it's saying a strong body can both be strong and supple when needed. I don't know. Give, give me your interpretations. I have no clue on this one.
And finally, three, virtues grow tall like a tree. Though there be shade, it will flourish forever. I guess this is saying that virtue has its faults, aka the shade, but even then it flourishes forever. I don't know, this also kind of escapes me. So now we get into the eras that actually have fucking dates, Jesus Christ. Up until about 7,000 years before the present day, most of Liyue had extremely high tides, which is most likely why the mountains are the way they are in western Liyue. Also about 7,000 years before the events of the game, Morax, the god of Geo, is born. Sometime between 7,000 and 6,000 years ago, he descends upon Liyue, where he creates Mount Tianhong and lowers the tides, revealing the majority of Liyue's landscape. Him and Guizhan become friends, and they create the Guili Assembly and help make a civilization that thrived. Also around this time, Cloud Retainer, one of those crane fuckers, also joins the Guili Assembly, marking Cloud Retainer as the oldest adeptus. It's around this time that Cloud Retainer and Guizhong create the Guizhong Ballista to defend the assembly. Around this time also, a civilization popped up in Lixia. During this time, it is said that the story Palace Beneath the Sea, found in Records of Jueyun, takes place during the time of the Guili Assembly. The gods of the seas propose a trade a year without storms and tsunamis, in exchange for a human bride. Apparently every pantheon needs that one Zeus clone fuckboy. I won't cover the story in too much detail, so if you're curious, go read the records of Dwayne. It's, pretty, it's a pretty nice story. The seas have been withdrawn by Morax, so humans start doing what they do best, building a dope-ass civilization. This time around is Lisha, and the remains of the civilization are still around today in the form of Dunya Ruins, Lingju Pass, and Qingshu Pool. Fuck pronunciation is hard. However, the prosperity wouldn't last. West of modern day Dunya ruins, around 6,000 years ago also, some celestial body, probably an extremely large asteroid, fell from the sky and creates the chasm. This celestial body fills the chasm with extremely valuable materials, making it perfect for mining and material harvesting. Also during this time, a lot of, a lot happens during this time, Havria, that salt bitch, was doing her thing in modern day Saltare. She was gentle and nice, but could barely lift a child with how weak she was. Sometime between 6,000 and 3,000 years before present, yeah, I know, super precise timing there, we get Andreas gaining his power and ascending to godhood himself. For some reason, supposedly due to a hate for humanity, he just imparts an eternal blizzard onto the entirety of Mondstadt for some reason. Sometime after this blizzardification, which is literally what the wiki calls it, Decarabian makes old Mondstadt with a grand tower in the middle. This tower, while not tall, actually goes deep underground, which I learned for the first time while reading the wiki, and stood menacingly in the middle of the old city. This was a time where the landscape of Mondstadt looked extremely different, as Venti hadn't come in with the hand of God and crafted a nation that looks like it does today. Because of this, Pilos Peak stood tall above every other mountain and Leonard the Adventurer, who invented the Wind Glider, made it his life goal to scale the peak. This is the story we got during Reconciled Stars, aside from the like fake sky shit, which I'm not touching with a 10-foot pole. But because Mondstadt was being ruled by that massive donger Decarabian, there was a bunch of people trying to seek refuge. They find this mountain that's green and beautiful and warm and not absolutely disgustingly cold, and they call it Salvindegnir, which is where the Dragon Spine Domain's name comes from. The civilization was fittingly located on the peak of modern-day Dragon Spine, and the ruins of the civilization is what we traverse in order to actually Actually open up Peak of Indignir. The civilization actually had an Irminsul tree at the base of the mountain in which they worshipped. A princess is born under this tree, and she receives a blessing that allows her to see into the future, which, based on the things that she sees, can be debated if that's a blessing or not. Around this time as well, for some wild reason, Celestia parks itself over the mountain right above the peak. This is actually really interesting because that tells us that Celestia can just move wherever it wants, and is more analogous to a spaceship. Around this point, after Celestia parks itself over the mountain, Princess starts to foresee destructions of multiple kinds, most notably a poison upon Vindignir, and the people fear that this is a curse set upon them. By who? Who, who the fuck knows? But whatever the reason, after Celestia decides that it was just done watching Vindignir, they just send a piece of Celestia hurtling down into the center of the civilization. This piece of Celestia is now known as the Skyfrost Nail, and is the first half of what completely just wrecked the civilization. What was the other half of the de destroyed Salvindignir? Well, it's kind of unclear. There are two possible things that happened. The first takes place right before the Archon War, and the other takes place after. The first thing is that the entirety of Indignir thrived off the existence of that one Irminsul tree, and in an unspecified time after the Skyfrost Nail fell, it split into three pieces, freezing the mountain and turning that Irminsul tree into the frostbearing tree we know of today. This kind of killed the one thing that birthed the prophetic princess of the civilization, and the thing that kept the civilization going, so the princess had to do something about it. Like the true engineer she probably was, she tried to take the most complete branch of the dying Irminsul tree and grafted it onto another tree. But surprisingly, that ends up killing both the tree and the princess, presumably because of the princess life was like connected to the Irminsul tree, which is also dying. So the thing that's unclear about this is the fact that the next point on the timeline says that Imun Lauker, a guy that left Vindignir looking for answers as to what to do with the 
big ass piece of celestia that just hit them, returns after the princess tried to make the new air mental tree to find everyone dead. It's unclear when this happens because this could be taking place after the whole Durin debacle, but it could also be taking place before that. And the princess's failure to save the Irmansul tree meant that everybody else had to die as well. Either way, this Imun Lauker dude shows up, finds everyone dead for one reason or another, plans what is to become Snow Tomb Star Silver in the mountain and leaves without a weapon, surprisingly, to go find a war to fight in. That thought process I struggle to follow on multiple levels. Finally in this era is the scraps of information we have that doesn't fit neatly in either time or place. All we know is that these bits of information take place before the Archon War. The pieces of information we're covering here come from Thundering Fury, Thunder Soother, and Berserker's Artifact Lore. First, Thundering Fury describes a tribe of humans living around a mountain worshipping the Thunderbird. This mountain they lived in could be Stormbearer Mountains, but it's hard to say for certain. This Thunderbird had a lot of fury, fittingly, and so these humans created festivals and sacrificial rituals, thinking that this bird craved blood of their people. Thing is, this bird couldn't give less of a shit and just saw these people as useless animals. One day, though, the humans decided to change things up a bit and had a boy sing to the bird. This singing pierced the clouds and took the bird's attention, and so the bird decided to talk to the boy because cosmic beings talking to humans because of what they're doing is pretty cool always ends well. <coughs> The boy promises to sing to the bird again, but whoops, would you look at that, we sacrificed the boy. His blood is good enough as a substitute, right? Understandably, the bird is fucking pissed about his only form of entertainment being turned into sauce. It's like if somebody tore your TV to bits and tried selling the parts back to you. And just like I would in that situation, he rains fury upon the tribe, killing them all and burning everything they knew and loved. Later, this Thunderbird was hunted down and killed, and the scorched earth the birds created was reclaimed as land for the humans. Next, Thunder Soother describes a Beast of Thunder, not to be confused with the Thunderbird, enslaving a group of people. The Beast of Thunder uses his control over, you know, Thunder to keep all of his slaves in line, as well as just destroying the surrounding land. Then this thing called the Thunder Soother, not to be confused with the Thunderbird or the Beast of Thunder, decides this guy's reign of terror is no more, especially after he was supposedly the, the reason the Thunder Soother's family was killed. The Thunder Soother shows up to the cave of the Thunder Beast, all, yo, 1v1 me, mano y mano, and so they fight in a literal fucking volcano because that's where the Beast of Thunder lived. The Thunder Soother won, taking the head of the beast and receiving a crown, but pulled a JD Salinger and just went full recluse after doing a service for humanity. And finally, we hear about the Berserker, whose home was just burnt to a crisp after humans and gods duked it out at one point. I don't know. It, it says there was a war between humans and gods, but I've never seen anything else mention it. The Berserker was seemingly the only survivor, which is terrifying considering he was also a powerful warrior and named the Berserker. And the fact that his iron mask was burnt to his fucking face. Because of having a chunk of metal melted to his face, he understandably went insane and yelled at Celestia on a daily basis. It was about as effective as a Karen giving daily PR complaints and one-star reviews on Yelp. So in response, he went on a killing rampage, basically becoming your average D&D murder hobo, killing anything that crossed his path. Apparently, he fought a single monster for several years before killing it, which is like if a mosquito just stuck to you for years on end. But in the end, the Berserker died as all things do, either in battle or after defeating his last enemy, which... Honestly, I'm so glad for it, because that shit sounds terrifying. And that's the entirety of the timeline from before the Archon War. The next video, the Archon War. Don't know what else you expected.